we should go ahead and get started. We're running a little bit behind time. Um, this ses session is called Emerging Topics, and today we're going to hear from some folks um, exploring innovative applications and tools in MOOCs. My name is Andrew Flackard. I'll be organizing the event. Um, we have um, some great presentations lined up, but a really short time schedule, so we'll try to stay on time. Our first presentation is uh, called Developing the MOOC, Visualizing Post-War Tokyo with Interorganizational Collaboration. So I turn it over to you, Toro. Thank you. Um, my name is Toru Fujimoto. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Tokyo. Can you hear me well? But <laughs> because the <laughs> silence is going on. So um, I hope you uh, keep your energy from the energizing keynote because I don't want to make you fall asleep <laughs> with, my, with my talk. So uh, anyway, I'm on behalf of my team at the University of Tokyo, uh, I'm going to talk about, to, to I, I want to share uh, our experience on making MOOCs, uh, make MOOC on about uh, visual impossible Tokyo. Okay, um, here is a quick overview uh, for those of, of you who are not familiar with uh, our university. Uh, our university, uh, 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 university of Tokyo is located Tokyo. <laughs> it sounds obvious, but uh, it's sometimes it's not. Uh, like um, Tokyo Disneyland is actually not located in Tokyo. <laughs> it's, it, it's located in Chiba Prefecture. And then s uh, likewise, there are some university named Tokyo something university, but it's not quite uh, located in Tokyo. So s maybe if you have a chance to be invited, by some of those universities, and be careful with that. <laughs> okay, anyway, um, it, University of Tokyo is established on um, uh, 1877, so uh, 138 years old. Uh, it's not as old as Columbia University, uh, but uh, it's one of, uh, it's the oldest uh, national university in Japan. And we have uh, 27,000 uh, students, and including uh, 3,000 international students. And we have uh, over 10,000 uh, faculty and staff. And that's, uh, that is our university. And um, um, okay, so here is the MOOC, uh, the overview of our MOOCs. We started. Uh, we officially started our MOOC project in spring 2003, announcing that we are uh, joining uh, Coursera Partnership, and offered our first MOOC in October 2013. We also joined uh, edX after that uh, last year, and uh, offered the MOOCs in November 2014. I'm going to talk about that MOOC. And now we have offered seven courses in total so far. Uh, we got more than uh, 210,000 registrations in total in two years, and 12,000 students who got uh, free and verified certificates so far. So it is, it's a great number for us. And these are the MOOCs that we already created, uh, produced. Uh, these four on the left are offered on Coursera, and then these two on the left, on the, on the on the right, are uh, offered on edX. So we have astrophysics and game theories in economics, and also international uh, politics and uh, computer graphics, and also the media studies and uh, uh, quantum chemistry. So we have a variety of MOOCs offered so far, and then. Um, something from the <laughs> speaker, but anyway. <laughs> um, so this is an uh, overview of the structure of our MOOC project team. Our project is under the administration of external relation funded by uh, President Leadership Fund. And last year, uh, University of Tokyo invited uh, Professor Shigeru Miyagawa from MIT to lead our project as a re director of online education. And my role, I, I'm, I'm here. I keep hearing something from the <laughs> speaker. 
What, what is this? You have no idea? But that is my fault, my fault <laughs> actually. I have something wrong, uh, but I wasn't sure, so. Anyway, um, let me go back. Oops. And then, um, okay. Uh, we have basically the, for the actual course development and um, uh, operation work for six, six and seven people for each course, and the duration is about five to six months. And uh, this is myself. And um, my role is basically the kind of a lower level field manager type of thing that I'm doing course planning, also doing the uh, most of the thing like uh, helping, supporting the project manager for each edX course and the course like courses, and then taking care of everything that's okay, and then reporting to my bosses uh, that uh, we are doing okay, then uh, checking others, univers how other universities are doing, and then so that the our bosses can make better decisions. So um, this is our case today I'm gonna talk today, uh, visualizing possible Tokyo. The instructor is Professor Shunya Yoshimi. He's a, a sociologist. And the theme is uh, analyzing the history of changes and uh, development in post-war Tokyo from different uh, perspectives using archived photographs and uh, films and uh, TV programs. The dura uh, duration of the course is four weeks each, so part one for, for four weeks for part one and for four weeks for part two. So uh, the course is offered in English and uh, the uh, result of the first run of the course uh, is uh, uh, we got uh, in total uh, we got uh, two twelve about twelve thousand registrations and uh, eleven hundred completions in total. So this is uh, how it looks. So it's quite familiar for many of you. It's kind of a standard format for the edX courses. We have um, lecture videos and discussion forums and then quizzes and peer assessment. Uh, essay exams. So I, got a br uh, I brought a video. Let me show you the video clip. Okay. This is a quick summary of the our course. did post-war Tokyo develop? Occupation. The Emperor. The Tokyo Olympic Games. Shinjuku. The gaze of the people living in post-war Tokyo. Technologies for visualizing post-war Tokyo. People who gazed and those who were gazed upon. University students. Knowledge industry. And the margins of urban society. Limits of visualization. Visualizing post-war Tokyo. Visualizing Post-War Tokyo is a project by the University of Tokyo covering the history of post-war Tokyo and gazes of people with the use of archive photographs, documentary films, and TV programs. Students of the program had the opportunity to create their own photo documentaries and analyze video. The format used was 
was a flipped classroom style. Students watched videos of lectures, worked on quizzes, and contributed to online discussions. In addition, face-to-face -face sessions were provided for freshmen, sophomores, and graduate students. In the online course, Professor Shunya Yoshimi gave lectures on the analysis of photos and films of post-war Tokyo and people living there. Students worked on interactive learning activities, such as quizzes and discussions. This course was also offered as a massive open online course, MOOC on edX by the University of Tokyo. After analyzing archived documentary films in the online course, students could watch the films in their entirety on an e-text system developed by the NHK Broadcasting Culture Research Institute. In the graduate school, Professor Yoshimi conducted face-to-face -face sessions and students discussed the films they had watched online reviewed the creator's intentions, and made a final group presentation. The materials, the uh, NHK videos are very valuable, and then during the class we can have access to these videos and documentary films, and then we gain a lot of primary uh, materials of what happened at the time, and what kind of television style at the time. Sometimes I wanted to ask somebody for more explanations and this way I think what happened in the classroom was more efficient for me. Okay. So this is a quick overview and uh, this uh, course uh, offered as a part of visually, visualizing Japan series in collaboration with MITx and HarvardX. As you saw on the video clip, we offered uh, two uh, flipped classrooms. And with, uh, uh, we used a uh, lot of documentary films and TV programs. And then uh, he, this is the main topic of my talk, uh, that here is uh, how we build uh, development, uh, how we build the collaboration. We started from Coursera partnership, and then some university leaders who were close to Harvard and M M MIT are interested in joining, um, joining edX. And uh, edX is also interested in uh, making partnership with us. So, um, so it worked very well, and we get more funding <laughs> to uh, build more courses on edX as well. And then uh, we cooperated with uh, Harvard and MIT to develop course materials. Uh, we help them to uh, create their course materials and for video in Japan. And with those global alli alliances, we got more power to negotiate with uh, N NHK and uh, other IP holders, uh, property holders. Uh, we still have to pay to get the license, uh, but uh, we get a m uh, larger discount uh, to be uh, licensed. So, and then uh, it was a big challenge for our team, but we could negotiate and uh, persuade people by appealing the significance of MOOC movement and by appealing that we can gain a great way of global outreach. So, uh, this is a wrap up of my talk. Um, there are a lot of challenges and ob obstacles to start up a MOOC project. It is very painful to conduct alone, but uh, uh, the MOOCs uh, meanings to us mean to us that making opportunities for open collaborations or making uh, opportunities for organizational changes. So uh, it is very hard, but uh, uh, bring uh, making collaboration bring us more excitement to my pro our project. So it is good to uh, have um, more collaboration with others. Uh, others who have strengths that you don't have. So, 
and also um, it is uh, important for us to making use of uh, the value of modes, like um, zero different aspect of uh, value of modes. Uh, for example, external pressure works for university leaders. Uh, it is kind of scary for top universities in Japan, uh, like the University of Tokyo, uh, being part of, uh, not being part of this global consortium. So, and then, uh, so some of them are convinced to be in part of this global collaboration. And as George Gimen stated yesterday, MOOC have a value for being compassionate. So it is part of the value of MOOCs that we can make use of. And also the global outreach is a pract practical value for us. And then because we didn't have that kind of way to uh, access to global audience like this before. So um, I'm pretty much running out of my time, so I'm gonna just stop here. Uh, so I hope my talk makes sense to you, and uh, thank you very much. Ah, okay, okay. So I, I will uh, talk about the uh, evidence of uh, MOOC students using uh, multiple accounts to uh, harvest the solution and put them in their main account. Uh, it's uh, I'm from MIT, from the Relay Group. Now, uh, the story behind this um, uh, research is quite interesting. How, how we got into this idea. Yesterday I uh, gave a talk about using prediction models to uh, see how students uh, perform. And when we uh, made pre these prediction models, we saw that some of the students are, predict are behaving in a very unpredicted way. Like some of them managed to do all the questions without seeing any resource, and some of them uh, ha just can't get it right in almost all their attempts. They need always to try, get a, try a lot of attempts before they get to the right submission. And then we started to investigate what's happening here in, in this uh, uh, set of students that are uh, totally unpredictable. And then we found that those are students that actually using multiple accounts and uh, to get uh, uh, s uh, solutions, and, and then we, we get into this uh, uh, research project. So uh, overview, uh, basically this is about identifying students who use fake accounts to harvest uh, solutions that they later submit in the uh, main account. Uh, some some uh, overview of the results, so uh, something like uh, 10 on 10, so among the certificate earners, we see that something like 10% of the students uh, harvest, we call that harvest, like they go and harvest the right solutions with a fake account, or well, we call it harvesting account, and then they submit it in the real account. So about 10% of the students are doing for the, for the certificate earner, earners, uh, do it for more than 10% of their correct answers. Um, they more cheating on high stake questions, that's reasonable if you just want to cheat your way to the certificate, then it's probably more reasonable to do it on high stake questions uh, first, uh, tends to be closer to the uh, deadline, that's also uh, in line with uh, uh, other works of uh, uh, Professor Pichard on uh, online uh, dishonesty uh, with uh, uh, on-campus uh, students, uh, less cheating on randomized questions. Again, that makes perfect uh, sense when you randomize a question, different accounts see different kinds of uh, uh, questions, and then it's harder to, uh, to cheat even if it's uh, uh, the same question, only, well, it's the same questions with different numbers, it makes it harder to, to cheat, but it's still possible because from the question you can figure the structure of the solution. Um, uh, what did surprise us is that we found out that a lot of the non-certificate earners also teach and uh, cheat, and sometimes they even cheat more than certificate earning students. And that was very surprising because why should this student cheat? Like the assumption is that you the, the, the cheating is something that people do because they want to get a certificate. Uh, I, I will get, give some, at the end of the talk, some uh, uh, possible explanation for that. Uh, closely related work, so a few weeks ago, uh, these guys from uh, MITx and HarvardX uh, published in an open uh, archive a paper in which they did um, a cross-the-board analysis of uh, how much these 
uh, a course on a lot of uh, MITx and HarvardX uh, courses. Now we believe we use a, a different approach, and we believe that they under underestimate the, um, the amount of cheating because they didn't uh, get into the, the details of the course, uh, which is something that we did because we we uh, basically did it on course that we run, so we we are familiar with the uh, app with. The, the details of what's happening uh, in the course. Uh, another relevant uh, work is the work of uh, uh, this team led by uh, Professor uh, Pritchard on uh, online che uh, cheating uh, in uh, on-campus uh, courses. Uh, basically, the contribution of our wor work that uh, it's uh, uh, to the best that, uh, of my knowledge that the f uh, first in-depth analysis of this uh, phenomenon in the context of uh, uh, MOOCs. Uh, so detection, how we detect uh, the students. So uh, our approach is something like a detective approach. If I would like to cheat, how would I do uh, that? So we define uh, two cheating modes. One is what we call instant mode. <coughs> instant mode is that you, uh, for example, you're working with one computer. Okay, you have, uh, edX doesn't allow you to, to, to be connected with two accounts on the same browser but you can use different browsers. So assume that you are using one browser with one account, one, uh, another browser with another account, and you just switch between the browser harvesting solution, put it in, harvesting solution, put it in, and another mode which is more like efficient uh, mode in which, which you like harvest a lot of solution one after the other, and then you submit all of them together, and that is something that you might be able to do even in, in in different locations. Like you start the day at home with harvesting some uh, some questions, and then when you're in the office, you have few uh, a few um, minutes uh, free that you take the note out of your pocket and you uh, uh, put them all in. Uh, the, the we define two types of account like we call harvesting account or harvester account to the account in which people <coughs> harvest the solution and a master account to the account in which they submit the, uh, the solution. And uh, the criteria that we use is that, the well, basically we, ide we uh, uh, connect these two accounts according to IP. So we do, we do what we call an um, IP group. So basically we put together students who use accounts that use the same IP. We get, we, from the logs, we can, we can know what uh, IP is a specific account use. It might be multiple IPs if someone is connecting from different places. Now, when you do that, it might be that you uh, put together accounts which actually belong to different users. For example, students working in dormitory or in cafe or uh, whatever. Uh, so we, we have some a lot, uh, more criteria. So one criteria is that the master never behaves as a harvester. So um, I, I will show a graphical representation of the patterns, but basically we, all, we, um, uh, we want to see that the master always behaves as master and the harvester always behaves as mas uh, harvester. If there is a switch, if then we say, okay, this is someone that is maybe suspicious for being a harvester or master, but the aside, our general approach is uh, to reduce false positive. We prefer to uh, be very certain about the people we detect, uh, even if it's a smaller group, and even if by that we uh, put aside people that might be cheaters, but that's like, uh, you know, you're not uh, guilty if uh, we can prove your uh, your guiltness with uh, very high probability. Uh, so uh, we also want to see that the, that the accounts that we uh, classify as harvesters are working only for the masters. They're not wor working from, for themselves. That's another uh, reasonable criteria for a fake account. Like uh, most of the correct answers that the harvester harvests are actually, u actually used by the master. Okay. Um, Another thing that the harvester doesn't earn a certificate. That's another uh, reasonable criterion because if a harvester <laughs> uh, is working for someone, someone else, then he will not uh, like to earn a, a certificate. Uh, and just again to improve, uh, to, to um, increase the probability to a very high level, we um, uh, 
requires that the master do that on at least 10 questions. Okay, so that's the, uh, the criterion. Um, and when we mine the data, we get like streams of a lot of students. Uh, and basically, uh, that, that's a graphical representation of the instance. If we, we are looking on the uh, time series analysis of an harvester, H stands for an harvester, I can, uh, well, ne never mind, I'm too late here. Okay, I, I'll speak a little bit up. Uh, okay, so that's an harvester, that's a time series of a master, and uh, basically the harvester harvests a question either by doing a brute force or by asking for show answer, getting feedback and the correct response. And then the master in very short proximity afterward, the master, M stands for master, the master inserts the solution and this happens on a lot of questions. So that's what we call instant mode. Um, the, the representation of batch mode, so basically we have the harvester harvesting multiple questions and after some uh, time, here we allow uh, a bigger difference in, uh, in time. We see the master account insert this, uh, these questions. Now in this pattern, what we require is that, well, basically I put here only three, three uh, uh, circles for three questions, but basically in this kind of pattern, we re actually require 10 questions in a row and less than 20 seconds between each submissions. Now that's a little bit unhumanable uh, uh, well, if you, uh, a, you, a human probably won't be able to read and answer the question so fast. So uh, again, and also when we connect this to uh, the pattern of the harvester getting the solutions sometime before that and both using the same accounts and all this, uh, th all, all the things that this one did were used by, by this one that gives us a very high probability, uh, so we believe that that's an, uh, a harvester master uh, couple. And now that's um, a, a, a approximation because uh, the the instant and batch mode not fall uh, exactly into these two patterns. But what it was more important to, for us was to have a, a to detect that. Uh, in the uh, code, in the logs, uh, and, and we know that, that some of the students sneak out from our net. Uh, okay, so first results. Some results. So basically what we see here is a graph that shows the uh, amount of cheating and how many students are actually uh, involved in this uh, cheating. And basically what you see on the y-axis is a presented of the answers that were cheated among the uh, correct submissions of a student. And in the x-axis what you see is the amount of students that did it. So for example, if we look on this point, so if you look on the x uh, trajectory, then it's about 3% of the students. And if you look on the y-axis, it's about 60% uh, of the uh, question, so it means that about 3% of the students, uh, of the certificate earners, uh, harvested more than uh, at least 60% of the correct uh, answers that they uh, submitted. Uh, another point, so this means that uh, this point is, uh, refers to 7% of the students, of the certificate earners, that harvested at least 20% of their uh, correct uh, submissions. This peak is, is, seems like an interesting point. It, mi it might be an optimal uh, point for cheating your way for the certificate. Basically, you need to get 60% of the points in order to get a certificate. Now, if, for example, you are doing 80% of the questions, then you would need to get something like, I don't know, 65% of the questions that you do, you know, that you did uh, uh, correct. So. That that's probably refers to some point that is optimal 
in a way somewhere between uh, the effort that is needed uh, that's also related to the type of questions and how much questions are randomized. So that's an overall uh, view of the results. Uh, some more results. So, uh, okay, 10% of the correct submissions of the course were uh, harvested, more cheating on high stake uh, questions, like 60, 60 uh, high stake questions were 60% higher, more likely to be uh, harvested, less cheating on, on randomized questions. Um, in most uh, submissions, cheating was the plan A. Like, in most submissions, students didn't try the answer got it wrong and then went to harvest the question, they just went straight to harvest the, uh, the answer. Um, some non-certificate earners also cheat. A any suggestion, thought, why, wh wh what would motivate a non-certificate earner to cheat? What? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean uh, a master account. Oh. Master account that should, any, any, any uh, okay, so that's. Uh, what? Okay, so, so I, uh, that's probably close to the hypothesis that, that I have, uh, which is uh, uh, more uh, cynical. Uh, then, then what you presented out, uh, tell out of curiosity. Um, so um, let's look on this. That's cheating uh, by chapter uh, among certificate earners. So what we see here, I'm, I'm I try not to get into the details because I don't have time, but that's chapter one and two. And uh, the red box refers to the amount of uh, correct submissions. So basically, non-certificate answer, non-certificate students uh, answered about 85% of the questions in the first two chapters. And if you look on, on this on this box, they cheated among 10% of this uh, submission. So they submitted 85%, cheated on 10% of them. That's the certificate earners. And you see it's a very uh, relatively stable trend. Now, if you look on the non-certificate earners who cheated, that the non-certificate earners who cheated, then you see that these people started cheating very high and they just decreased. So basically, what you see here is quite amazing. Non-certificate earners who cheat uh, answered correctly about 80% of the, of the questions in the uh, uh, two first chapters, cheated uh, on about 60% of them, and then dropped out from the course. So uh, basically what we, what my hypothesis is, is that those are the real uh, uh, professionals. That's maybe people who are simultaneously cheating in, I don't know, 10 courses. And then they figure that, for example, in our course, there are a lot of randomized questions. So it's harder to cheat. And then they just drop it and continue with, uh, with other courses. That's, that's my. Uh, my assumption, uh, which is which is supported by by the data. Actually, I <laughs> we we predicted that that that's how the graph is going to be, but we were amazed how uh, how the uh, how the graph confirmed uh, what we we thought that we are going to uh, to see. So, uh, some points for discussion, which is more like questions, things that I were, was hoping to, to discuss with, with the, the audience here, which is probably interested in, in uh, behavior of, of, of how to use MOOCs in, in class, and, and this is probably something that affects uh, our uh, usage of, uh, of MOOCs in class and, and not only in class. Why students uh, are doing this? Is, this a, is it a threat to the certificate uh, systems of MOOCs? Like if a lot of people will do it, uh, then I don't know, maybe it's hurt, it decreases the value of certificate in uh, MOOCs. Uh, prevention ver uh, versus pedagogy, it's just a, a big uh, problem because the easiest thing, uh, the easiest way to prevent this is just not to give feedback to students. But then it's like um, a collective uh, punishment. 
because you are punishing the good students because you want to prevent the cheaters from cheating. And, and the, the, the better way to deal with it is probably to have, for example, question pools or randomized questions, but that requires a lot of uh, effort from the, the instructors, so they need more resources to prepare the course. So this is al another question, uh, another um, topic for, for discussion. Uh, what should we do this, uh, with these uh, uh, students, if at all, I don't know. Uh, we, we didn't do anything with these students. Um, and uh, many more, for example, does it happen in other um, um, uh, systems in which uh, users can um, uh, connect with multiple accounts, future directions that we are working on, on prevention uh, methods, uh, identify cheaters without relying on, uh, on IP using maybe machine learning or things like that, uh, does it happen in other digital learning environments? And also, if uh, we, we're thinking about sharing the code for identifying these people as an analytic tool, maybe through edX and in other platforms, so if anyone is, inter is interested in uh, uh, getting the code, uh, collaborating and, and running the code on his uh, uh, MOOC or his uh, environment, so we are happy to, uh, to collaborate on this. And thank you very much. If you have any questions or corrections, and. Um, Thank you very much, and uh, we'll keep things moving. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, we're running a little bit short on time. Uh, hello, my name is Mary Alice Wu, and I'm from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, I work in a large crew of people, and so some of the people who helped me with this presentation are up there. Certainly, everything that we do in our office is a group, a team effort, and um, I want to give a shout out to all of my colleagues back at home. So. Um, my study is on on demand, and as everybody knows, we have moved, we've migrated from session-based courses to an on-demand format in Coursera. I'm not exactly sure what edX has done. Um, and this occurred about well, 10 months ago or so. And one of the challenges that we faced is, is we spent about two years trying to get together and figure out what are the metrics that we're going to use, how are we going to define the different variables, how are we going to look at success, and all of a sudden we felt like the rug got ripped out from underneath us a little bit, and we had to start thinking about what we were going to do with an on-demand style. And so when we had, <laughs> see, we had no choice. <laughs> we had to move to you know, on-demand. Um, but this really rose uh, several questions in terms of, how does the on-demand impact the participation and the completion of the course? How are activity patterns different between the session base and the on-demand courses? And I think the big answer that everybody wants to talk about is time. So time is a huge element when you think about on-demand versus session-based. In a session-based course, you have the instructors releasing material on a certain time scale, right? In an on-demand environment, all that material is dumped. It's released to everybody. And so people can consume that information on their own scale. They can look at it on their own time frame. So we really took this concept of time to try and help us define how we were going to look at these courses. So to give you a little bit of background, um, we had this experiment course. And the course is microeconomics. Uh, it's introduction to um, microeconomics by Professor uh, Jose Vasquez, and the cool thing about this course is it's actually been taught in Coursera multiple times, and it gives us the opportunity to do kind of uh, a little bit of tweaking, I'll say, to be nice. We get to do a little bit of experimentation, and uh, one of the things that we did last year, right around this time frame actually, was we taught the course in a four-week session, an eight-week session, and a 16-week session. And then we found out that Coursera was going to go to this on-demand platform, and so the professor decided that it would be cool if we kind of did this pseudo on-demand. So we have the four, the eight, and the 16-week courses that have already gone, they've launched. That was in last fall. And then in December, when Coursera announced that they were going to do the on-demand, we decided, okay, even though this is on the session base, we're just going to release everything as if it's on-demand. And the nice thing about doing it this way is it's actually the first data that we've had the ability to analyze. So at the moment, we're still waiting, and I think that Adriana said that we were going to get the data in a couple of weeks. We're all excited. <laughs> but this is the only data we have at the moment to kind of try and look at how we're going to reconceptualize some of these variables. 
So here's the course attributes. There were eight different modules. Um, so in a four-week class, those modules released twice a week. In an eight-week class, once a week, 16, once every two weeks, on demand, all out there. Okay? There were 90 videos in complete of 10 hours of videos. So the, theoretically, you could sit down and watch 10 hours of videos all in one fail shebang. Um, and there were eight quizzes with about 105 points. They, they upped it five points there in the last one. In order to earn a certificate, you had to earn 80% of those quiz points. So the, um, the number of enrollments, um, you'll notice the eight-week class is really, really small. And um, the good news and the bad news is, is there's actually an experiment going on in the eight-week class. And you'll see there's a lot of changes. There's differences between the eight-week courses, the eight-week class, and the rest of them. But you'll see in that on-demand, we had 44,000 people enroll. That doesn't necessarily mean that they actually went into the course. That just means they clicked on the button to an enroll. Uh, so this is the major overarching theme. Are there systematic participant patterns in on-demand courses that differ from our session-based courses? And so the first thing that we look at are videos and quizzes. Those are our two activities. I didn't have time to add in the forums, but there is definitely room there to explore how forums are used in these different types of modalities. Um, we look at clustered patterns of activities, and I'll get a bit more into that. And then we look at the satisfaction within our courses. So we start with videos. And um, we liked our old-fashioned TV, since we're in a new era here. So the first thing that we think about with videos, or at least the first thing I think about with videos, is binge watching. Anybody watch Netflix and Amazon Prime? And yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> I think binge watching. And um, with the on-demand platform, certainly it's just like Netflix. You can turn it on, and you can just watch as many videos as you want. So my question was, are people doing that? All right, so let's look and see first about the number of average viewing days that people took to watch the material in our courses. Um, so if you think back before the 8th to 16 week, material is only getting released sporadically, right? And so if you're going to watch the material, you're going to want to see that material on multiple days because you don't have access to it until multiple days. But if you look at this generic pattern, um, everything is pretty much the same. It's not very different. It's very flat here at the end. So there's not, this is 29 days here. Of course, the 16 week just keeps going. There's really no cutoff there. Um, but the red line there are those eight-weekers. And those eight-weekers are really odd people. Um, and it has nothing to do with the fact that they're eight weeks, actually. But it's just because we were messing with those people in a good way. <laughs> so, um, so if we want to look at like, what the statistical difference is between our number of video viewing days, here's our on-demand. And you know what? That seems about right to me if we're going to binge watch, right? We're going to have a lower number of days that we're going to consume that information. These all four are statistically different. Um, so if you look at the little confidence interval bars here, you'll see that they don't overlap with one another. And so you have um, the lowest number, which is four weeks. Of course, those are released every two modules per week um, in the four-week one. Uh, so that's pretty close to the on-demand consumption rate. Now remember, there's 90 videos. There's a lot of videos. All right, now we go to my question of binge watchers, right? The Amazon Prime, the Netflix people. How many videos are people watching on average? And the, the answer is about three here on the on-demand, which once again lines up with our four-week people. Um, and then you'll notice that people in the eight-week are actually viewing more per day, and people in the 16-week are viewing slightly more. And they're all, if I remember correctly, those lines are very close to one another. But I still think they're all statistically different from one another. All right, so that answers my binge watching. They're not really binge watching as much as I thought they were. Um, so now we go on to qu quizzes. You know, you can, you can go in and you can be an assessor. You can go in there and take lots of quizzes. Maybe you're cheating, maybe you're not cheating. I'm not sure about that one. Um, but there are a lot of people who go in and they just take quizzes. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the clusters. But for now, um, we've got just kind of like, are people doing better in the course when they take these quizzes? This is really noisy. Um, but generally, the same pattern flows right here. Um, you'll notice these eight-weekers again. They're really standing out. So anybody? Want to guess what we did to these people? We did something good to them, actually. Um, what we did was we actually gave them their grades every week. And that interaction with them every single week kept them interested enough that they actually were more likely to complete the course. Okay, So nobody else got that intervention 
only these eight-week people got their grades every week. Um, so that's why we were messing with them. But I told you it was in a good way. We weren't doing anything bad to them. Um, so the average quiz score here, uh, the average quiz points earned, once again, those eight-weekers, they're really doing well. They're doing fabulous up there. Everybody else is pretty much the same. I mean, those confidence intervals are really close to one another. So there's really not much difference there between the four, the 16, and the on-demand. They're all getting about the same number of quiz points. Um, and now I kind of move on to my clusters. So one of the things that we did uh, when we started with Coursera was we were, everybody was really interested. Who's taking our courses? Um, how are people consuming our information? And so one of my colleagues came up with um, some analysis with clusters. And so she looked at the, uh, how people were interacting in the course. So you have the percentage of videos watched here on the x-axis. You have the percentage of quiz points gained on the y-axis there. And um, actually five clusters emerge from this. It doesn't look like five clusters emerge from this, but this is because it's my eight-week people. Now I'm gonna go a little bit not in order here for a particular reason. So this is my eight week here, and one of the things I want you to look at is, right here, you have a traditional model, right? You have zero, zero lectures, zero quiz points, not gonna do anything. And then you have the people who kind of do half. And then you have all those people up there who do everything and they get a certificate. That's your kind of traditional line of, of working in school, right? You go to lectures, you take the tests, you graduate, you get your course grade, you get your course credit, and so forth. So that's the traditional path. Remember, those are the people that we gave the grade book to every week. So those people are facing the traditional path. So then we go to our 16 week and well, you'll see the difference here. The only reason there's really a difference here is because I just have more people. So remember there are more people in the 16 week class and each dot actually represents one person. So the more people I have, the more dense my, my picture is gonna look. So there's really not that much difference here in terms of the pattern. Um, and then if I go to my four week people, then I get really dense here and you can really see this pattern come out, but also look at these pink guys and the green guys over there. What does that mean? So I like to call these people the PBS watchers. You can also call them um, the people who like to binge watch. So these are the people who are just watching all the videos. Um, interestingly, these red dots here represent people who don't do anything but go in and download videos. So that's what those red dots mean over there. The green dots up there, the light green ones, those are people who are just going in there and quizzing themselves. They don't care about the lectures. They might be the cheaters. They might be the people who just want to test their knowledge. That's the altruistic person in me. <laughs> um, and so let's look at our on-demand people. So I want you to try and keep that in mind, and I'll flip back and forth. And here's my on-demand. Here's my four-week. So what's the shift that you see in those little dots? What's the difference there? We got quiz on the Y, we've got videos on the X. So here's my on demand, here's my four week. Yes, more videos, less quizzes. That's what's going on in our on demand, on our pseudo on demand is you dump all the videos and guess what, they're gonna consume those videos. Um, but they're not necessarily going to take more quizzes. And so what you see here is this shift, this blue and purple shift shifts down. Um, so if you go up here back to the four week, you can see the nice little shift down. Um, so that's really what's going on in our on-demand class is this consumption of videos that we just showed way back when, um, when we were looking at the binge watchers. Um, and here's just a breakdown of the statistical, I'm sorry, not the statistics, the percentage within each cluster. Um, so I highlighted the red ones, which are very different. So this one, I guess, shouldn't be red, it should be green. I did this at the last minute. Um, the reason is 75% of the people have very, very low activity, um, which I thought was interesting because they immediately get access to the information. So you enroll, you click on enroll, and you immediately have access to everything. Versus people who um, are in four week, eight week, and 16 week, they don't immediately have access to everything. Now, granted, I did only select people who had um, actually done something in the course. So you would have had to have done something in the course to appear in this chart here. Um, and then here's those video people. Remember those video people are, they're, they're on line here with the 16 week people, but they're still pretty stand out there from the four and the eight week people. And then this is really surprising to me, this high quiz, low lecture, it's so different from the rest of them. 
Um, they're just not in there taking quizzes. They're only in there doing videos. And the other thing is high activity. And what high activity means is that they did everything. So they did the quizzes. They did the lectures. And um, that, of course, is highly correlated to the number of certificate earners. Right? So based on this chart, who do you think, which group earned the most certificates? It's not a trick question, I swear. Week eight. Week eight, yes. They are the ones who earn the certificates. So giving people grades every week, reminding them how they're doing in a course is a good thing. Whoops. All right, and here we go. Here's the percentage. So we have four week, eight week, 16 week, and on demand. And these eight weekers, 16% of them got certificates. This is a huge percentage difference from the on demand, which is 3%. So that just underscores the fact that people are watching videos, they're not taking quizzes. In order to earn a certificate, you have to take a quiz. Makes sense. Right. Um, and if you just want to see the average number of days it takes to earn a certificate based on uh, these time frames. So if you look at the four-week class, so the blue bar is a four-week class. Of course, you have to take all the quizzes, and so you have to be in the class for four weeks in order to earn a certificate. So that's why you have the red, the blue, and the green bars are at the max, 100%. So you have um, less than four weeks for the on-demand. About 18% of the people who earned their certificate earned it in less than four weeks. Um, if you look at the, here, the 14 to 16 weeks of the on-demand, about a little over 30%, so 33, one-third of the class earned their certificate after entering the course and being in that course for 14 to 16 weeks. Um, we did normalize this, so that was all set to, if you registered on December 1st, we counted from de December 1st to the end of week one, end of week two, et cetera. So just because you enrolled in a course um, midterm um, doesn't mean that your time is not reset. All right. So then um, we have surveys that we do at the end of every course. And one of the questions that we ask people is, did you get everything that you wanted out of the course? And one of the reasons we do this is because we feel that there's a little bit more to the picture than just certificate earning in Coursera. We feel that people go into the course um, in order to get what they are looking to get out of it, right? Do they want to get particular kind of information? Do they want to understand um, how the Earth spins? <laughs> Do they want to test themselves on the stars? They're going in there for a very specific piece of information. It might be the whole course, but it might be part of the course. And so that's why we ask them this question. We ask them, did you get what you wanted out of the course? I've gotten my two-minute warning. Um, there is actually, even though it looks like the on-demand is slightly higher, it is slightly higher, there's actually no statistical difference difference amongst all four of these categories, sorry, five of the categories. Um, but I do want to get to one thing which I think is really interesting, and that is, is that we asked the question, what limited you and your ability to get what you wanted out of this course? And so this is just a nice word cloud. These are all the courses and what they said. You know, a lot of people said the lectures, the assignments, time, and so forth. And I want to wrap it right back around to what we were talking about before, which is, are people able to consume information in the time frame that they want to consume it? Um, and so we looked at uh, what people said in those open-end questions, and we coded all of them to look and see what people said about time. And if you look at the four, the 16, and the on-demand, limiting factors for people was time. So it didn't matter if we gave them the information all at once or if we progressively gave them the information. They still continually said to us, time limited my ability to get what I needed out of this course. So thank you. Thank you very much. I have to show uh, one thing. Oh, yeah. There. My peanuts. Ah, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Peanutize me, right? Um, so next, and just by the way, we're all going to run a little late to the next session, the town hall, but I think they'll wait for us. Um, but next, we are going to hear about effective learning analytics, uh, description and prediction on student emotion in MOOCs. Uh, both from the University of Notre Dame, IBM, and the University of Sin Singapore. Uh, no, I think John and uh, she would also talk to you. Maybe you're just going to share. Just, just, take okay. Okay. just remember to talk into the microphone if you have your phone instead of the video. Thank you. So while uh, this is being set up, uh, let me begin uh, you know, the, uh, 
this conversation. So first, it's really a great opportunity for all of us to come and uh, share with you the work you have started to do in a collaborative project between uh, University of Notre Dame and uh, IBM Research. So my name is Vikram Sengupta. I work for IBM Research India. In case you're wondering, uh, you know, IBM and education, whether they go together. So education has emerged uh, as one of the key focus areas for IBM uh, in the last couple of years, thanks mainly uh, to the effort you know, IBM Research has been taking. Um, and we are also hiring, by the way. Um, so this, this, uh, this uh, uh, project that we will uh, talk about actually started uh, in an interesting way. Uh, USAID announced a fellowship program last year, and uh, you know, it was open to uh, PhD students in the United States who wanted to go and spend uh, you know, time with research group in other parts of the world, including India. So I had put in an uh, opportunity description. It was broadly along the lines of the work that we do, uh, which is essentially about how do you use data and analytics uh, from data, analytics on data collected from educational contexts to really uh, gain insights about learners, pedagogy processes, and how do you use that to personalize the education and improve outcomes. So that was the opportunity, and then uh, John applied, and uh, you know, we started talking. So Notre Dame at that point of time was in the process of uh, trying to introduce a few MOOCs, and they have in, in fact introduced it this year. And so we started discussing whether we could use the MOOC data to collect some of the, you know, to do some of the analytics that we wanted to do. And then I asked him what is the first MOOC about. He said it's about uh, it's statistics. It's called I Love Statistics. And it's been motivated by the fact that many studies have found that uh, learners often have a lot of anxiety about statistics. So uh, that, that was really interesting to me because around that time I had also started looking at the role of affect in education. Uh, we are all learners. Now we know that we learn much better when we are sort of happy and curious and uh, less when we are you know, sort of frustrated and uh, bored. Uh, so we discuss started discussing that in addition to the data we typically collect uh, from MOOCs and you know, a lot of the analytics that you have you know, seen in various talks, whether we can start collecting affect-related data from, from learners. So that, relate, uh, you know, that really led to a few new design elements we introduced in these MOOCs that you know, John and the team will talk about about uh, essentially these have to do with uh, self-reflection prompts and aff other affect-related questions that we ask the learner at specific points in time to understand how their emotional trajectories are going on, along with, of course, their sort of cognitive and skill development. We feel that this holistic understanding of the learner will sort of, uh, you know, eventually help us you know, serve them better. Uh, so with that introduction, and I'll leave it to the rest of the team to take it forward. Thanks, Picker. Uh, my name is Crystal D. Jagger. I'm a learning and designer in the Office of Digital Learning at the University of Notre Dame. Um, just here, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, sort of the context where the course takes place. And so we have this course called I Heart Stats, which Bikram mentioned. Uh, it was designed to be a nine-week MOOC with eight weeks being content modules and the final week being for an exam. Uh, students were expected to spend roughly four to six hours a week. It was free. Um, and again, uh, there were several learning objectives, which is in the what you'll learn box that you see there. Uh, basically, we wanted to help get uh, learners to be able to uh, distinguish between levels of measurement, perform basic calculations to determine statistical significance, uh, to use standard methods of representation to summarize data, and to interpret and assess the credibility of basic statistics. Uh, for the most part, this is very much like an intro level stats course, uh, either at a graduate level or just generally speaking. It's very basic, but I wouldn't consider it to be like a dumbed down version of statistics. Uh, one of the instructional goals is to reduce learners' anxiety about statistics, and we are sort of curious to know what we could learn from student affect uh, in this area. As far as the instructional layout goes, like I mentioned, uh, it's nine weeks. There are nine modules. Eight of them are content. And basically, each of the modules consists of these types of components. Uh, this is, by the way, built in the edX platform also, since we're partners with them. Um, so there's an introduction. The professor does several lightboard lectures. He also offers real-world scenarios and applications that I think is part of the reason why people might struggle in statistics just my personal opinion, but uh, so we have him. He's all very animated and in his shoe closet talking about how you can use shoes to represent different levels of measurement. Uh, very interesting situations that he presents, uh, things that most people uh, locally and globally would have some sort of familiarity with. 
uh, finally, I guess it's not finally, but uh, <laughs> there are a couple of TAs. Uh, one of them, Sarah, you see here, uh, she offers a war room breakdown. I guess this is sort of a play on the CNN, like war room. Uh, we had a new studio that they basically uh, used to break down these real world scenarios. Students were provided with uh, extensive notes in a PDF format and it was able to be downloaded. There were many practice problems along with discussion uh, where lots of students participated. Help forums for each module that students could uh, interact with the TAs on um, homework and a weekly video update from faculty. And to talk a little bit more about uh, data collection and how we were able to get the data that we got is my colleague Zhao Jing. Thank you, Crystal. My name is Xiaojin, Xiaojin Duan, and I work as a system engineer for Office of Digital Learning. Thanks to this project and uh, edX, I have another cool title. It's Data Czar. So, <laughs> So, as most of you already know, um, all this data and the visualization are available to us with just a few clicks, again, thanks to edX. Uh, for, this, for our iHeart Stats course, we had over 24,000 students enrolled for, it, for this class, and we have 229 students registered for, as a, uh, earn the verified certificate and um, some more demographic data. And uh, the median student age for this class is uh, 32, and we have over 50% of the students who are between the age of 25 and uh, 40. And um, for the education background, we have almost 86% of the students who earned the bachelor degree or the advanced degree. And we have 41% of the female students and 59% uh, of male students. This is another proof that girls can also do math and statistics. <laughs> this is our enrollment geography data. Uh, you can tell our course reached to 183 countries. And um, I didn't do the statistics, but I doubt our great Fighting Irish football has fans in over 183 countries, but our iHeart Stats course has fans in over 183 countries. So that's very amazing. Uh, as Crystal mentioned, the primary instructional goal of this class is to reduce the students' anxiety of statistics. So how are we going to assess if we accomplish this goal? after several hair pulling brainstorm, uh, brainstorming sessions with different partners on campus and of course with IBM, we decided to embed, to embed some smart sensors throughout the course to detect the students' emotions. So, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I Personally, I don't think the um, course completion or the pass rate is a more important uh, metric to assess the students, uh, to assess the uh, success of, of MOOC courses, but I'm wrong most of the time. So to people who, who still think the course completion rate is an important fac factor to assess the, the success of a MOOC data, um, this is uh, the data for our course. So we have 832 students passed, the, passed this course, roughly 4%. But the very encouraging part is for the verified certificate students. We had 114 students passed, and it's almost, uh, it's 49%. It's very encouraging. Yeah, now back to the smart sensors. So the first start type of the smart sensor is this uh, um, Self-assessment mannequin, we also call it the same questions. Students are asked to pick one of these options to describe how they feel um, about the course in general at different points of this course. 
And the beauty of the STEM question is that it works pretty well with a very diverse background of students, whether English is their first language or not. Here is a sample of the student's response data after it's been cleaned and de-identified. Another type of the smart sensor is a emotion list question. Uh, students are asked to pick two emotions from this list to describe how they feel after they complete a specific learning activities, like uh, watching a video or doing a homework quiz. Um, about this emotion list, we didn't just throw in any emotions we like. It's based on the previous research studies. All those emotions are related to teaching and learning. And additionally, we added some emotions it's specifically for online learning, like uh, isolation. Here is a sample of the student's response to the emotion list question. Next, our star researcher, John, is going to share what all those data mean. Thanks so much, Jing. So I know we're uh, uh, running really low on time, so I'll try and move as quickly as possible. So uh, what is the most common? We're all experts here on MOOCs, right? So what, tell me, what are the most common MOOC emotions from, from our list here? What's the guesses here? What do we got? Isolation, did someone say? OK, what else? Frustration, boredom, surprisingly all negative. What else? <laughs> Confusion. Okay, so I'm just gonna. I ju we just have some basic histograms. We don't have prediction models yet. That's what we're. Oops, sorry. That's what we're working on uh, for LAS. So uh, these are. Oh, here we go. These. This is a basic histogram. Oh, run the wrong way here. Of the. Come on. Of the emotions here. So it's really fascinating that the guesses are very different from the results here. So uh, hope is huge. I mean, it's kind of impressive, like mo MOOCs. I mean, so this is a great point, though. So it, this is over time for each emotion. So as hope goes down, what's lovely is that things like pride, relief, enjoyment go up. So it's, uh, yeah, it's fascinating. Things like isolation, emotions that we had designed specifically for the MOOC, not really important. Uh, shame, sadness, anger, anxiety. Notice the anxiety about stats. So Anxiety goes down. So very uh, interesting. And that's over time. Let's see what else we got here. OK, but the other thing we learned is that emotions don't simply, it's not simply hope. That's inaccurate to speak about learning emotions simply as hope, but that it's co-occurring emotions are critical here. So it's, this is where the secondary or, or uh, uh, second emotion comes into play. So you have enjoyment hope, which could be very different from anxiety hope, let's think here. So uh, these are the top 10 emotion clusters that we had here. Contentment, hope, hope, pride, confusion, hope. So then, uh, well, what happens when we add something like a dropout function or we start looking at those students that are staying and those students that are leaving? Is there a difference? I mean, how do students feel uh, before they leave uh, the class, before they drop out? And this we were kind of pleased with. Uh, and again, these results have to be vetted for statistical significance. But um, I mean, I in these, are the, these are the people who drop out in red. So these are the ones that stop. These are the ones that go here. And uh, it seems like enjoyment plays a role, as you would guess. I mean, if you enjoy the class, uh, you're not going to leave. Uh, so then this is now. Uh, results to specific t specific activities. So how do students feel about specific? So this is a homework assignment, so problem set, practice problem, videos. This is the amount of pride that we get for each type of activity. So let's see here. Got to keep going. Confusion. Okay, so these are the emotion trajectories. Students go through just different trajectories. The incredible thing here is that we have a ton of different unique trajectories. So it could be sad, happy, sad, 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 happy. And you would think that maybe there are five key trajectories of emotions that student follow, students follow as they go through a course. But there are lots of different trajectories. And then this is what we're working on now, just to conclude, to give you a bit of a teaser, is we, we want to correlate uh, activity log with emotion so then we can predict and intervene. So we've identified 
primary key uh, emotion, MOOC emotions and context, where we're headed, correlate emotions with engagement activity. So then we can say, okay, you're bored, let's mix it up, let's give you different content in the feed. And uh, yeah, so prediction, intervention, design, research. You can see how on, on lots of the other research projects that we've seen here, it would be so valuable to splice in an emotional level, uh, emotional layer. And uh, yeah, I'm just looking at uh, Professor Chen here and thinking, wouldn't it be great to add emotion to his A-B testing? I mean, that would be fascinating. And yeah, anyways, thank you so much for your patience and for staying here. Great, big round of applause to all of our panelists. And now let's run over to 147 for the town hall. Thank you all.